Hi, this is the FAQ video for my steel testing. Um, you may have come here through either the description of one of my steel tests or perhaps through um, just your subscription feed or whatever. Um, I do rope testing, which means I cut rope with knives until I no longer cut paper. My goal here is to make a repeatable kind of test that will show how long steels are likely to hold their edge. Um, I repeat the same things that I can repeat, my controls, and I vary things that I intend to vary, such as the steel, and then there's some other things that I, I can't help that remain variables that I'll certainly address here in this video. I get lots of questions, um, and these is come, I'm hoping this video is like a one-stop shop. Uh, but yeah, what I set out to do is to have some form of test that you can compare one steel to another, while still hopefully taking into account the uh, variables, both controlled and uncontrolled. So let's get into the first question. What is your test? Well, I cut rope with knives that have pre-done angles on them that I have done myself, so not generally factory edges unless it's specified. Um, and I'll cut rope with them until they no longer bite into a held sheet of paper. So I'll hold a sheet of paper and slice with it. It's um, a measure of what I feel is absolute sharpness. I'm not testing knives until they go dull. I'm testing them until they just don't do that anymore. So most of the knives I finish with still have perfectly good working edges. Um, and I feel that this is a way of saying that, well, if it cuts 50 pieces of rope, that equates to a lot of real world EDC use because rope is fibrous and frankly quite nasty material for knives to cut uh, in it with a great deal of frequency. Um, I feel that the paper test is a, good, is a good way of just testing that actual sharpened edge bevel. It doesn't rely too much on um, the supporting structures behind it. Um, so I'm just testing that 17 degrees, that single bit of, um, this, you know, the, the shiny bit you can see right along here on this one here, so sharp. I'm testing that and not the rest of the knife grind. Just wait until that goes, um, you know, less sharp. So that is my test. Why are you doing this? Well, there is a lot of talk uh, in the knife community and all communities, lots of people talking. Um, I always find it helps to, when someone is talking, which I often do, we all do, you can reflect back on my um, work, so all of my videos, you can see how I formed that opinion. Uh, a great, um, you know, in the acting world, a great philosophy is don't tell me, show me. Uh, I was a theatre geek and I always, I think that's a really worthwhile thing to have in mind with a lot of things. Don't tell me, show me. If you have results that are different to mine, don't tell me, show me. Um, I know it's not in everyone's capacity, but I think it's a healthy way. Even if you just document with well-written prose and, you know, some way of recording, like a report or something, whatever you can do, don't tell me, show me. So that's what I've, I try and do that as well. Um, and that is why I'm recording every test. And yes, I speed them up because it makes for more compelling viewing, I find. Um, but yeah, uh, it's something that you can actually watch, a tangible source of information. And there are others, but that, that is why I do it as well. Uh, inspirations behind my channel was the Blunt Truth For You YouTube channel from some years back, just kind of stopped. Uh, he did a bit of cardboard cutting and recorded his, and I found that really interesting, and I thought, well, might do the same thing. And I think it's valuable. I don't think this is the be all and end all, but I think it's valuable uh, to have uh, actual shown um, testing of knives rather than just spoken about testing of knives. That is all. That is why I am doing this. What systems do you use and why? To sharpen edges. So, sure, I use a work sharp knife and tool sharpener. This is what I started off using. The systems I use are ones where I can repeat angles. So this exact system here has a guide in it that makes a knife edge 20 degrees. Unless the knife is too thick to fit in there, it will make the primary cutting bevel 20 degrees when I force it into here. Some knives are too thick. I couldn't fit a, um, a cold steel trail master in here, for example just didn't fit, it's too wide. But um, this is the basic and this is what I started with. So um, that's 20 degrees and that is pretty, it's a pretty solid and pretty standard 20 degrees. Um, when they've all been through that, they're all that. So that's that's what I was after. And then I moved on to using a Lansky. This is probably the least precise of them because I didn't use an angle cube and I just still don't use an angle cube in um, conjunction with it. So with this, uh, you can still choose rough degrees, but yes, the knife face, how far it protrudes from these clamps here, and um, a few other little variables can make it within a few degrees. So I did use this for a while. I'm sort of moving away from it now. I'm getting a KME system soon. Thank you, Nick. Um, which uh, I will use in conjunction with an angle system for these kinds of edges. 
And then lastly, I use a Tormek, which is this big system here on my bench. I'll just show you that now. This is a Tormek and it comes with an angle card, which you can use to measure the angles of the knives when you suspend them and uh, sharpen them. So that is a fairly precise, probably the most precise of all of them, I would say because uh, you really can dial the degrees right in and factor in the loss of the stone and all sorts of things. So those are the systems I use, repeatable ones. One knife was hollow ground, the other knife was flat ground. You can't compare them. Well, I can, because <laughs> I'm making videos doing it. But yeah, for sure, um, I see what you mean. Um, so a flat ground knife is um, going to have more material behind this cutting bevel than a hollow ground knife, that is for sure. However, I'm pretty satisfied that I am just testing this very edge, which when it passes through the rope, this part of the knife doesn't really have much to do with that. Just mainly the cutting bevel does, and the cutting bevels will always um, be the same. They won't look the same, but they'll be the same in terms of degrees. They'll look vastly different. See this big thick knife here? This makes a cutting bevel that is really, really quite tall. It almost looks like a, like a Scandinavian knife or something. And then this knife with the same bevel on it, because it's a thinner stock, the bevel is far less exaggerated. However, both of these are at 12 degrees. This one just used, had to remove a lot more steel to get there at that cutting edge. So I'm pretty happy that that is not too much of an issue. It may be, and if that is the clinching point for you not using my tests and disregarding them entirely, then fair enough. Probably not much I can do to convince you of that one. However, I do think I'm fairly satisfied I'm testing the absolute edge and not the supporting sort of secondary or primary, you know, whether you call this a secondary or the primary, whatever, grind. That is the best I can do with that one. The cutting board is what makes the knife dull. I get this a lot. It's the knife hitting the cutting board, you idiot. Fair enough. However, I do the same thing every time and the knives perform differently and then when I repeat the test with the same steels, they do the same. However, number of times cut rope is a bit easier to say than number of times pass through rope and then impacting on cutting board. Um, that is the long and the short of it. Um, I did do a test once with a cutting mat, like a softer craft mat, and it did extend the edge life a little bit. So yes, the cutting board is a factor. However, it's not the only factor. It is just the test. Just think of it all as one machine. The rope, the cutting board, is why I don't change the cutting board as well. The rope, the cutting board, my human arm and the knife is the machine. And that is, these are the results that that machine produces. Why don't I use a cutting mat? Well, I didn't start by using a cutting mat and I didn't want to have to retroactively alter all my data using one. Um, I was happy with my cutting board. I'm still happy with my cutting board. It's getting numbers that are repeatable uh, when I use the same knife again and do it again. Um, and yeah, whether or not the board is contributing, yeah, it probably is. Um, if I just did held rope testing, that would probably be completely different to a cutting mat. It's just kind of what I've settled on. And as I always say, if you would like to see different types of tests using different apparatus, do them yourself. You should test specific knife A versus specific knife B. I get this all the time. Um, I'm just a single person enterprise. I have some Patreon support, which pays for the rope, um, but I don't have the funds and more importantly, I don't have the, the will to damage that many knives, especially ones when people offer to send them in to me. So um, what I, what the basic, you know, overarching result of my work is that it reduces the resale value of knives and it does limit the, you know, once a really tall bevel, especially is on a knife, um, to get the bevel back to a shallow bevel, you need to remove stock inwards onto the knife. So that is something I'm not willing to do on loaned knives. So. I get to steels when I can get to them, and I get to knives when I can get to them, but suggestions of do this knife, do that knife, are just not helpful, and they really don't influence me in any way of what I do. I'm always looking out for things that I haven't tested yet. It's just kind of, I get to them when I get to them. So um, there is that. I, I just don't have the resources to buy just for doing these tests. I never would unless my Patreon was to times by 100. You know, it's just, and I wouldn't, I don't want that anyway. There's, there's other things people should spend their money on. It's fine. But yeah, I'm just one person and my enterprise isn't large enough to do random knives out of the ether. Especially a lot of the knives that are suggested are knives that are custom or, you know, um, knives that just, or steels that just aren't in knives that I can readily buy. So that is the answer to that one, unfortunately. What do you do with all the twisted sisal rope you cut? You should make fire starters. Uh, I get that a whole lot. Um, this isn't the most flammable material in the world. It's, uh, despite having a 
massive surface area when it's bunched up and um, even when you you hold it together with some petroleum jelly or, or similar it just doesn't take the flame that well at least this specific brand doesn't uh, it's possibly some kind of agent inside it which helps it I guess maintain shelf life or maybe even to be less <laughs> a bit flame retardant who knows but yeah it's just not the best uh, material for fire starters so I just pile it up in bins and eventually just use it to make a new dog bed for Ada or Cedric they usually tear them up and they get scattered through the garden and it's pretty biodegradable it seems so it rots away with the rain and the elements so uh, yeah fire starters is really uh, not apparently the solution as far as I can tell can I send you a knife to test it depends I, I, I do appreciate people want to help this endeavor um, and some some people are really insistent and they really want to see like a certain knife but you just got to know it's going to damn it's it's not going to be the same knife when it gets back to you um and i'm i my conscience is such that i i struggle to accept free gifts i always feel like i'll have to send you something back there has to be some kind of interplay between us it's not the immediate yes that you think it would be hey why wouldn't you just take this free knife or why wouldn't you take my knife do it and send it back a postage starts to cost a whole bunch especially sending from america and back which is where 60 percent of my viewers are and um and b yeah it's um it's more than just a quick sharpen and test. It's, you know, it does change the knife and does reduce that resale. And some, and I'm not a professional sharpener. Sometimes I put little, because um, I use all my own knives, sometimes I put little waves and majors and things and I'm just not comfortable to risk other people's gear doing that, generally. There are exceptions, obviously. Some people like probably think out like, oh, I got a guy sending me a couple of knives now, um, which, you know, he's pretty much got just for this test done. I'm going to do it and send it back to him and he's fine with that. And it's much, very clean and crisp sort of deal and that he knows you know exactly what's going on i just don't accept everyone's knives i'm sorry to say that bevel looks hideous i would never do that to my knife <laughs> yeah you're right some of these bevels are pretty dramatic so this is a survival knife that has a 12 degree bevel on it it doesn't make much sense for a survival knife to have but uh it is what tested well and this is what got this knife 410 cuts of rope before it no longer held slicing paper with the standard edge it was about 150 so um, this is um, there is something to these edges but yes they are not good looking it is just the choice you want to make between edge retention and the physical appearance of your knife and also other factors yeah it's a more delicate edge it, you know it always is with less material behind it so lots of choices I'm not saying it's the right way all I'm doing is testing them how much rope do you use well, I probably buy three to four hanks of rope per week. Um, each one is 10 meters, and each one costs about $12.50. So I'm probably spending about, probably about 150 a month on rope. Uh, and then there's other consumables and knives as well. So um, but yes, the rope I do consume a fair bit of. Um, and it does make bins full of the stuff that does sort of end up just composting or rotting away in my garden or whatever. It's fine, but um, yes, I do go through a lot of rope. Now, uh, you should tape the blades to see which part you're actually cutting with. I get this all the time. And yet, you know what? If I'd done this from the beginning, I probably would. And I still sometimes do it. But generally with a knife, because I'm cutting on a cutting board, this part of the knife, on this one, for example, is almost... I'd have to really put the board at the end of the table to even use it. So generally the part I'm cutting with is from where the belly starts, about usually about halfway along the blade and a blade of this size, but with a bigger blade, usually the last half, one and a half inches to two inches or so. It is not super precise. I'm not measuring them out in millimeters. If that's something that breaks it for you, then so be it. But um, yeah, the tape is just, it started off as a thing. I just didn't have that kind of tape around. I had some sticky tape. I didn't have duct tape. And I do things very much on the fly. I get an idea and I do it that same day. So it was just a more of a symptom of disorganization than anything else. And it seemed, I'm I'm happy with my own testing. Like I am. I'm, I'm happy enough with it. I wasn't, I've gone through stages where I have changed things and wanted to change things about it mainly getting different angles and using the workshop less, whatever. But um, yeah, I'm happy with it. Like, and I feel like, and I feel like I do the same type of cut every time. Yeah, within human margins, but I feel like um, generally I'm using the same portion of most blades, the same amount. Um, one test I did do that I redid was the man bug because I felt I was using too little of the blade. Um, so I redid that with a slightly bigger knife and used the whole blade of it. So yeah, it'll be generally about one and a half inches of uh, knife. So that is the best I can do on that one. Well, the best I'm willing to do. 
I have a knife with that steel and it cuts way longer than that other steel. So your test is wrong. You may well have such a knife. This is a single test that has its variables that aren't controlled. Uh, one knife that beat the other knife that you have might be at a higher rock well. It might be ground differently. It might be, you might have been using it on different things to the other knife. Maybe you prefer one knife to the other knife. So you've got um, an element of, I want this knife to be better. There are lots of things that are at play here. But yes, you may well have a knife that cuts better than the knife that I tested. For sure, for longer, whatever. You might have a different edge finish on it. This is very important to understand that this is just one type of test that will give you general information. Um, pursuing my results down to the finite numbers, probably not the wisest way to use the data. I would look at the bigger pictures that these things are showing. But yes, you could, you could absolutely have a knife that say in 154cm, your 154cm knife might last longer than your um, S30V knife. Your D2 knife might last longer than your 154cm knife. No worries. It's very, very variable still. Why don't you wear gloves? Uh, I also do knife reviews, and a lot of this is forming a, there is, this is a really good way of forming a picture of the ergonomics of a knife, um, and that is by using it in my naked hand. Um, and yeah, some knives will blister me up like crazy. I have very, this hand is very, very strong now, and it has very, very rough skin all along this part of it. Um, it is, um, you, find, you know, there is a, there is a difference here, because uh, I've done this a lot. So yeah, it is a good way of getting to know a knife, and that is why I very rarely wear gloves. On retests or on tests that just go forever, or if a knife is really bad, I'll put a glove on halfway through. But generally, I do use it for getting a picture of the knives, experiencing the whole thing with, you know, in full colour, so to speak. This test doesn't take into account Rockwell or heat treatment or a wide number of things. You're right. Um, this is not a test on Rockwell. The companies very rarely tell you exactly what Rockwell they're using their knives on. Often you have to go forum hunting for it, or they tell you between numbers, which are very, are very little use. So if a knife's between 57 and 59, that's three different numbers it could be. So I don't know. I would love for every company to make every knife at 60 and send me that knife, and then I would have the best data, the best possible data. But I don't, and they don't. If you think I should stop doing this because of that emission, then you should probably just stop watching because I'm not. And it's a um, it's a variable that I can't control for sure. And I may get knives that are in various rock wells that I do test and they perform differently. And I'll record all the data. Every test I do, I record the data for, and it is what it is. And you can view all of that data. Um, there's, and you can watch all the tests. So that's the best I can do for you on that one. But yes, you're right. I can't take Rockwell into account. If I know it, I'll tell it. And um, we work from there. You should get a robot. Your arm is a variable. Um, you might do each cut differently. You're absolutely right. But, and I can't believe this actually does get suggested that I should invent some sort of pneumatic cutting arm. The catcher cut test does that. Um, and you can watch those tests as well. So that you might find that of interest. But yeah, as I said, my body is definitely part of this machine. I do the same type of cut every time though, um, as best as I can. Let's see. So each cut I do, I start about here, and I push downwards in a motion. So it's a, it's a push slash rolling cut. So a push cut is just straight down. This is a rolling cut that I feel best imitates, best imitates how an average person would do a cut. Yeah, not scientific, fallible human body right here, without a doubt, but as I say, it's the best I can do. I'm not ever going to, the, the flaws in my test that I actually agree with, I'm never going to hide from. And that is definitely one. I am a person and I could have the shakes one day. I could, you know, for sure, I could accidentally slip and twist, whatever. Um, but it's just something, not something I can really fix. But again, people seem to be enjoying this test. So the only other solution is either build a robot or stop doing them. And neither of those are really feasible right now. What's the best still then? In these tests, the word best doesn't really have a place. I can show you what will cut rope the longest before it no longer cuts into freehold paper. If that means best to you, then the best is Rex 121. But if best means to you a combination of positive attributes of knife steel, then I'd look towards something like M390. Although it won't cut as long, it has a great mix of all the um, desirable traits of knife steels. Um, 
S35VN has the same as boring as it is. Um, VG10 at 154cm, you won't pay as much for them, um, but they'll all do great as well. There. There's a lot of good out there, and um, the really the only terrible steels that I've come across are the ones that are obviously terrible, which are things like the Z Hunter steel, steels that aren't treated correctly, that can't hold a thin edge without folding within a few cuts. So, best doesn't really have a place here. Um, if you're after a general sense of what's a good knife steel. I've done other testing, such as rust testing, impact testing, those sorts of things. And yeah, I would probably lean towards M390 as being the best, but that has nothing to do with these tests, really. Or these tests form a very small part of that. Um, these tests won't show you what the best knife steel is. They'll just show you what cuts rope for a long time and then loses its, and, and how quickly it takes to lose that fine cutting edge. What rope do you use? I use twisted sisal rope. Uh, it's a natural product made of cactuses. Um, and it is fibrous and it is um, widely uh, attainable. It's the Grunt brand. I've gone to the same hardware store and bought it for this whole time. Grunt brand twisted sisal rope, uh, $12.50 per hank. Each hank is 10 meters. Um, generally, I unpack it straight before I'm doing the test, unless I've done a test very recently. Um, because if you leave it out in the air, it can swell a bit. I'm not sure how that affects the um, composition of it and how easy it cuts or how hard it cuts and whatnot. So, yes. Grunt brand twisted sisal rope is the one that I use. I want to do my own test. What do I do? Uh, well, you can do my exact test if you want. All I would say is pick a medium, stick with it. Once you've started doing your first few tests, iron out any bugs there, but then just do the same thing every time. As best as you can replicate the same conditions every time, then it's a bit of a more reliable test. If on one test you cut cardboard, then another test you cut rope, you can't really compare those two knives in their edge retention because cardboard and rope are quite different. But if in one test you cut cardboard and another test you cut cardboard, then you've got yourself a comparison there, at the very least. I mean, everything's comparable, I guess, but the comparison will be more, the, the circles will overlap a little bit more. That is all I'd suggest. Um, but yes, please do. There should be more of this. The knife steel companies aren't gonna do it for us. They are, um, They'll tell us how great their steels are, but they are not really telling us what's the best angle for them or what the best, they're just not. So, and whether they know or whether they just, they're leaving it to us to decide or whether they leave it to the companies to tell us or whatever, it's just not happening. So there should be more of this. My, my data is a drop in the bucket of what needs to be a full bucket. You are biased against steel X, company X, whatever. No, I'm not, I don't care. I do not care. I buy all the knives generally, unless they're lent to me and then I, I want every steel to do as good as it can do before it no longer cuts paper. Like, that is all I want. I could not care less. I don't see steels as a team to be on. It is just a substance. As impressive as it is and as interesting as I find the substance, it's not a person, it's not an ideal, it's not an ideology, it's not a religion, it's not... I just don't care. If um, I get an LC200N knife tomorrow that cuts like shit, I'm going to film it and show you how shit it was. Like, it's fine. Um, it's not something I care too much about. And companies... There isn't really a knife company that I dislike. Um, I like the obnoxious ones like Cold Steel. I like the fancy ones like Zero Tolerance. I don't care. Um, it's just, I'm just purely doing this out of interest and it would make a joke of my last two years of my YouTube life to be favoring steels over another because it's just a pointless, pointless thing to do. So there is no point in that. So no, I'm not biased against any steel. Can you do steel X, Y, or Z? I get this all the time, and it's always a pretty random steel that you need to actually seek out from a vendor and get a knife handmade in it. Um, some people are happy to do this, and I have actually got a couple coming my way, which is an amazing thing for someone to have done. Um, but he's obviously of a similar interest, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, a lot of the steels left now are very much, um, I have to actually, you know, Spyderco don't just make a knife in it. or Because that's why I like Spyderco so much, is because they make so many different steeled knives. And you can just buy them at retail, so it's really easy. Um, often, yeah, you have to get stuff handmade and put together. Like Rex 121, I had to get Gary Creeley's Mako knife to do it. I wanted to do it because it's one of those you know, glass ceiling steels, but still. Um, probably if the steel hasn't shown yet, it's just because I haven't had the means to get a knife made of it. And as I said at the start, I just don't have that much cash to just seek stuff out. The patrons help, but they're largely just covering rope <laughs> and you know, minimizing the guilt at me, minimizing my resale value of these knives when I pretty much ruin them. Not ruin them as in they're not usable, but ruin them for other people wanting to buy them. So if I was like, hey, do you want to buy my Kildeman? You'd be all like, no. <laughs> So yes, uh, I'll get to it if I can, but 
Uh, hand sharpening on a whetstone gets the sharpest edge. Why don't you test that? You're probably absolutely right when a skilled person does it. I'm not a skilled person with a whetstone. I have whetstones and I can use them to save my life. But um, I'm not Michael Christie. I'm not Brig Big Brown Bear. I am not, uh, who else is a good whetstone sharpener? Weeder fan. Check out those guys if you want to see whetstone edges. Check out Michael Christie in particular. He does the edge testing on cardboard with hand done edges. And very interesting stuff. But yeah, just not me. Uh, I don't have that level of talent. Don't quite. Have, it's one of those things. If YouTube, YouTube would have you believe that everyone can freehand whetstone a knife and you know whittle hairs with it. I think that's BS. I think when people can do it, it's such an event that they make their own YouTube channel and show everyone. Usually, uh, even the best knife sharpeners are using KMEs and things these days. So, no shame in that. No shame in using a machine for sure. No shame in using an aid. But um, yeah, I just can't freehand sharpen to the point where I'd be happy to do steel testing with it and say that it's repeatable. Do Scandi edges. Scandi edges are hard because they all are at different degrees. They are intrinsically linked with the stock thickness of the knife and their absolute edge is so huge that it does strain to that point of, I was saying earlier how I'm pretty happy that I'm only testing the absolute edge because all my edges are just a few millimeters or so. Uh, with a Scandi, I'm less sure. I'm less sure, so I just don't wait into that as much. If I get a Scandi knife, I'll usually see how much rope it cuts and publish that just to check and just to release the info. But in terms of comparisons, um, often they're quite different. Um, often they are, you know, some are 12 degrees, some are 18 degrees, some are like 25 degrees. It's just, um, and I don't really have the um, large amount of stock of Scandis to just compare dozens of them. It just hasn't happened and I'm not sure if it's going to. But as I get Scandi knives, I will test them and show them. Uh, it does seem that Scandi edges hold their edge for a good long time, but then go rather suddenly dull. Whereas um, convex edges, on the other hand, are not as blindly sharp and crazy as, as they are at the start, but then they hold that sort of less awesome edge. They hold that sort of 70% edge for a lot longer. That's kind of what I've figured so far. What's the best kind of edge for edge retention? Well, against rope, it certainly does seem to be a thin V or slightly hollow edge holds its edge for the longest against rope. That is what is the data is showing me so far. Um, convex edges uh, seem to hold a good working edge for a good long time, but they lose that paper gliding edge fairly quickly. They round over. Uh, greatly illustrated lately in, I had my friend Brad here's knife, uh, which is the same knife as this knife. And this is in a relatively tall convex, but it's still a convex, so it's still quite thick. Um, and whereas this is a hollowed um, edge of about the same amount of degrees, maybe a few more, but this outperformed this by a huge margin and this was so much easier to push the rope than this one. Um, so as regards to a, a test, then this is not only more enjoyable and easier to test, but also seems to hold its edge for longer. This is by no means a useless edge though. All I'm talking about, remember, is rope cutting. Not wood cutting, not chopping, nothing like that. So. There are merits to convex edges that these just cannot compete with. So, um, but yes, it does seem to me so far that the longest lasting edges are the thin ones against rope. That could change if you change the material. I don't cut cardboard. I don't know how cardboard would go. Test cardboard, not sure. How do you cut? Do you do the same way every time? Yeah, I showed my cut before, but in case you're just skipping to this question, I try and do a it's a hybrid between a push cut and a slice. So I'll start here at about the knife and I'm just using the belly of the knife. I'll push forward like that into the cutting board. A push cut is where you go straight from the top and just apply pressure to the top of the spine and go like that. That is what companies like Rockstead will do in their videos. And I feel like the push cut may have better attention, but I'm not sure. That's just a theory of mine that I'm working on, which I'll test one of these days. But yes, I do try and do the same cut every time. Just a human though, so I can't guarantee that's happening 100%. What are the general things you've learned? Well, uh, for a start, uh, it seems that, and this is all the things I'm learning are just general. These are the things that I'd be happy to take to the bank. Um, it seems like if you have two knives, uh, the, or the same knife edge, so the same degree bevel, and you have one knife in a powder steel and one knife in a non-powder steel, the powder steel will cut for a longer. So there is something in powder metallurgy how those blades form edges and whatnot. Uh, that does seem to last longer and that is more or less a uniform rule. Um, it is only when I change the edge angles on the non-powder steels can I get them to perform at the levels of powder steels at um, 
the higher angles. So if you're getting what I'm saying, so say uh, S30V at 20 degrees, um, I need to take say VG10 down to 12 degrees to be able to get it to outcut that. It can happen, but um, yeah, if you compare apples with apples and have uh, two V grind edges, both of 20 degrees, the powder still is generally cut a bit longer. But moving on to what I've learned more recently, uh, it does certainly seem that with cutting rope at the very least, which may translate into EDC use, which I guess is what we're after really, um, it does seem that lowering your edge angle to, as in the number is lower per side, that does increase your attention and it does cut for longer. Um, I think this is simply because it's that principle of a finer point, putting more pressure into that small, into a smaller surface area, just cutting the rope for longer, more force, um, which means sort of less spread of force, which means that it's um, just going to hold its edge and it's got less behind it, so there's less to sort of mushroom out and it maintains a reasonable cutting edge for a longer time. That's what seems to happen now, at least it's, I've done, well when I started moving down to 17 degrees, it's where it changed a lot, and then when I moved down to 12 degrees, it's, or in 13 degrees, what I've been doing lately, it's where it's changed a whole bunch. So it seems like by making your angle shallower, then it should make your uh, knife cut for a bit longer against rope, and maybe therefore EDC materials. But as far as what else I've learned, um, well, I've learned that people are pretty hungry for this sort of information. And despite what I'm telling everyone, um, that I'm just the one person, people seem to be taking a lot of what I'm doing to the bank, which is really nice. And I guess it's flattering. It does make me feel better about doing all this and the considerable, I guess, investments that I've had to make. But this is all my own interest. I'd probably be doing this anyway, even if I didn't have a YouTube channel. It's just kind of how my brain works. But, um, yeah, I've worked, I learned that people are interested in how their knives are actually going to perform, which is nice. I mean, it's not that there's anything wrong if you just buy knives to look at them and admire them, but I always like to know that if it comes to the crunch, you can actually cut with something for a fair while. And it's good to know that a lot of these steels are, the more complex ones, they are actually worth it. Whether or not they've got the right price tag on them, I can't comment on that, but it seems like putting more effort into making better steels does pay dividends in terms of edge retention. So that is something that's cool as well. How could you make your tests better? Well, better, I guess I would just make more of them. So much more of them. I would have a hundred of me doing the same tests over and over again and really pulling that data and drawing midlines and averages and all sorts of things from it. Just more volume is the best thing that I could do for my tests because I think as just a person with my resources and capacities, I don't know there's much more. If I could start again from the beginning, um, I'd probably use a... Maybe I'd use a cutting mat. I don't know. I'm not sure, but it is kind of what it is by now. Um, I am always for using different um, angles and different finishes, and I'm just about to get a KME uh, sharpening system, which will let me really dial things in and put better edges, more interesting finishes, things like that on, and really do some more comparing, which would be really nice as well. So, yep, just more is the best way I think I could make this better. Where can I see all of your results? Uh, in this video, and in fact in all of my YouTube videos, you can follow the first link in the comments. It takes you through to my Patreon. That is not expected that you join that. It's just a good place to host things. And then through that, there'll be a, an initial list and then a Google Doc. That Google Doc is where all the good stuff is. It is maintained by one of my Patreons, uh, and I assist him sometimes when I'm really terrible with that sort of stuff, who is really doing a um, brilliant effort and a much appreciated effort in um, balancing the books and keeping everything recorded. So, yeah. There, that is where you can see it all. What steels have been notable lately? Um, well, lately I've been really impressed by a couple of non-powder steels. So VG10 and N695 really took well to having this very, very thin edge, this very thin 12 degree edge on them. Um, much more than I thought it would. So that was a real surprise. Um, really, really uh, must come down to the chemical compositions, the actual structures the molecules put together they can really withstand a lot of cutting even at higher degrees um, even more so than some of the other cheap steels like HCR 13 got a really good result it got like double the standard you know or almost triple these were almost four or five times longer um, the VG10 on the Kaiser and the um, uh, the uh, N695 on this Cudeman here really really impressive um, yeah, you have to ugly your knife bevels up a fair bit to get them, but um, that was what's really got me lately. And of course, uh, doing the retest in Rex 121, that was really interesting to me as well because uh, it was actually done with a fairly high polished grind 
at a fairly thin um, uh, edge. So what the guidance is that you take Rex to 15 degrees per side and leave it coarse. I kind of didn't do that at all. It's almost the opposite. I took it to 13, not the opposite. The opposite would be 30 and you know, 90 degrees, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, it got a 3000 grit finish on it and um, it still cut better than my previous edge, which was a bit more broad, which was 17 degrees rather than 13 degrees and was toothy rather than this new fine one. But yeah, more testing will come on that Rex knife. I'll um, certainly, once I've got my next sharpening system, I'll be giving that a um, at least a 12 or a 13 degree uh, coarse bevel and we'll see how that goes using like a diamond stone or something. Nice V bevel rather than convex as well. We shall see. So those are the ones that have impressed me most lately, or the things that have been most remarkable to me. But otherwise, it's really pleasing to see that you can get really good performance out of your more basic steels just by altering the, the edge geometry, which is a simple enough thing to do if you've got um, powered tools. It might be a bit trickier if you're just operating on manual systems, um, especially just on uh, bench stones and things. But that's been of interest to me. Uh, next, uh, so why don't all knife companies grind shallower at the factory for their factory edges? My theory for this is that yes, um, this 8CR13 MOV edge, when I reground it to like 13 degrees or whatever this is, cut for way, way longer than it would have ever with the factory edge. But factory edges are always designed to be impressive out of the box and not fail. There is always a risk of failure the, long, the lower you take your angle. So even though I've shown these to be pretty resilient against wood, um, the basic fact is that there is less material at this cutting edge. So knife companies want to be able to sell knives to anyone, even dickheads. And dickheads are going to pry stuff with their thin pocket knives and stuff. Like it's, they're going to pry with things that aren't meant to be, you know, there are pocket knives made for be prying with, of course, but um, yeah, people are going to do stupid stuff with their knives. They're going to cut into wire when they, you know, they're going to renovate a house and use this Kershaw um, Atmos to cut drywall. Like, it's going to happen and they want to be as resilient to those people as possible. They don't want them coming back saying, my knife sucks because the edge, you know, took had a big chunk taken out of it when I tried to cut a nail. You know, it's it's for that. I, it's what I can assume. It's safer to sell an edge that, yes, is still sharp out of the box, still will shave hair most factory edges these days. But yes, they don't have that super fine geometry behind them. They've just got that really nice apex, but without the uh, you know extra few degrees that really make a difference in terms of edge retention, or so it seems. So that's my best guess as to that. Um, the, super hard, the super hard steels aren't worth the time taken to resharpen. I can see where people come from with this because um, they are sharp, harder to sharpen. The hardest steels I've had to sharpen so far are CPM 110V. I just found that tricky for some reason. We'll probably all have different opinions on this. Uh, the Rex 121 was very length, was a very lengthy sharpening process uh, and Maximet is of course difficult to sharpen as well. Um, I must note though, none of those require different things to be done, just longer time spent. Um, any higher end steel is going to need diamond abrasives. So if you have those, I think it's still within your control to be able to do them. It's just whether or not you, you want to spend the time on those. It's, it's definitely a consideration. And as has been shown um, by myself a little bit, but by other YouTubers, um, if you do get more of a, a malleable steel, you can often keep these alive just by stropping them and keeping that edge going for a long, long time. Eventually it will round and sort of convex over, but um, yeah, in the, in the interim, it's um, just as feasible to have a steel of lower uh, repute, but maintaining it more frequently, and that will keep your hair shaving sharp edge if that's what you want from your knife plate. Uh, what's the most comfortable handle so far? Uh, I get that a couple of times. Uh, it's always going to be a fixed blade. Some folding knives are quite comfortable, like the Manix 2 is quite a comfortable pocket knife to use. Um, I notice compression lock knives, I do start to feel the compression lock a fair bit, so the Para 2, even though it's got a good handle, it wasn't great uh, for um, a comfort in the end. Like, this is after a vast amount of rope cutting, obviously. But yeah, it's going to be something like my, well, my Creely Blade to Mako is probably the one that jumps into my head because I did 1300 cuts with that knife and wasn't in a real degree of pain afterwards at all, apart from a bit of a wear blister, but that's just from a repetitive task. I think that's probably the standout. Falcon even F1, although I haven't done a test with it, it's lasted long enough to really challenge me. My Bark River Kefar, 
the simpler the handle, the better I find. So this one, I, when I tested this knife in its factory grind, um, did a really good job, and it's uh, it was a long cut. It was about 400 or so cuts, and um, yeah, this just nice, basic, simple knife you can cut with something like this for a lot longer than you can with, say, what is a fine handle, but, um, you know, this has got, you know, it's got, cha it's got a channel in it from the st for the start, like it's a folding knife. The angular, they're, you know, absolutely fine for EDC carry, but yeah, these do wear on me eventually. So it's going to be a fixed blade, something like my Bark River or my Mako or something like that. What would you change if you were starting from the beginning again? Well, I think when I started from the beginning, I just had the workshop. I would love to have had the confidence to just use the Tormek. I don't think I had the Tormek at that stage, but I just had the workshop. Um, and it's just, I just had to learn the Tormek first and learn how to properly dial in angles. I would love to have just started from 20 degree Tormek edges um, because they are more precise, even more precise than the Lansky, the Stone of the Lansky, than the workshop ones. And most importantly, they don't <laughs> ruin tips. They don't do what workshop can do a few you know, slip with it or if you hold it on for too long, they don't recurve your blades as, ba as badly. You can you can muck up with any automated system, any powered system has its risks, but I would love to have just started with the Tormek um, and I would love to have chosen maybe a different type of rope that wasn't so expensive because this isn't the cheapest rope in the world. I didn't think it'd get this big. I thought it'd just be a few steel versus steel tests, but the demand was there. And um, yeah, I wouldn't mind having a different type of rope, but it's way too late for that now, so <laughs> whatever. So yeah, that is all the questions that I've thought of people asking and that have been asked to me. So I'll update this video later if more accumulate, but um, generally the main philosophy is that um, if you find what I'm doing of value, if you find that it mirrors your real world use, then that's good. Um, if you really disagree and dislike what I'm doing and don't have any faith in it, then that's fine too. Uh, I'm not making you watch, all this is for free. Uh, I'm making some Patreon money for it, but it is pretty much all going back into knives and rope, largely rope. So, um, and you know, yeah, as I said, it's um, certainly not a money-making endeavor. I'm just doing it out of curiosity. If you find offense with that, then I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. It's a sad way of looking at the world. But um, overall, uh, the feedback has been great. So I do appreciate everyone who continues to watch and um, I'll keep doing them as long as people are finding it interesting. And as long as I'm interested, really. Righty, so two often um, similar questions about uh, the really thin edges. Uh, one, when I put one on the Cuterman, how is that gonna go for survival type tasks? Is it just gonna fold straight away? Is that a silly edge to put on? Well, let's just abuse it for a second. Check this out. Seems fine to me. Um, but let's move on to a more EDC type knife. This is the American Lawman at 11 degrees per side. Very, very narrow. Um, just for a rough, random banging simulating, I guess. Just edge of a wooden desk. Moderate hardness. Definitely put some rolls in that edge. Here, let's take some photos.
So yeah, interesting enough, it seems like it's going to be on a steel to steel and on an angle to angle basis. But yeah, as I say, um, it's generally probably going to lose a bit of uh, rigidity at, um, uh, you know, for, you know, when taking into account clumsiness or, you know, hitting stuff that is hard from time to time. Going to be a great slicer against fibrous and soft materials, but um, yeah, if, you want, if you're after something more durable, then 11 degrees isn't it, I'd probably stop at about 14 or 15 or so, I reckon because um, that is just a little bit too thin and you can see on the knife it's so exaggerated already. So there we go, hope that answers your question. I would um, perhaps just leave these crazy edges, and a, a crazy edge I would say is something 12 degrees and under, I'd say leave that to just pure slicing knives or just leave it to me to test and, and then maybe keep it a bit, a bit uh, steeper for yourselves. Fixed with a micro bevel, quick and easy. Stick with a bevel, a micro. If you go maybe under 14 degrees, I would say. That's a uh, 16 degree micro bevel on an 11 degree edge. All right, so I've done my um, video and I'm watching it back and I've, this next day I've changed my shirt. And I think I can finish this on a more positive note because there's some really cool stuff that I've started to come to terms with since I've been doing this last batch of testing specifically. Um, whilst there will always be knives that hold edges for longer, um, which for sure there is, so say your 8CR 13 MOV, it's never going to catch you know S110V in terms of edge retention. No matter how probably, unless you're really fatten this one out and thin this one out, it's not going to be within the realms of what the average person is going to do. Um, but yeah, what I'm thinking lately though is, I used to have this video, I have this video called How Low Will You Go in Terms of Blade Steel, and I was like, VG10, that's as low as I'll go. And I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, because I think what I've shown in my tests is that if you're happy to like mess around with your steels just a little tiny bit, um, maybe get a more optimized angle for EDC purposes, I reckon you'll find from at least 8CR, you know, 4116, AUS8, whatever, Working your way upwards from there, I think you're going to find they're pretty much all, on a basic level at the very least, pretty fucking competent at being pocket knife steels. You may have to mess with these ones a little bit to get them to that point, but it's a cheap knife, and if you've got the equipment, then I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And I think missing out on good designs, which is what I used to do, I used to say, ah, oh, geez, CRKT, I'd buy that knife if it wasn't in, you know, 8CR. I think it's. I think I've changed now. I don't think I'm quite on that um, train anymore. Because and maybe this is just because I'm lucky enough to have the capacity to modify my knives a little tiny bit. Um, now I feel like you know, if it's a good-looking design, I'm going to go ahead and give it a try. Because I am very glad I didn't miss out on this knife. This is probably my favourite new knife of 2018, and it's an 8CR 13 30 dollars Kershaw job. Um, it's just an excellent design that I would have missed if I was not feeling a little bit. You know, yeah, fuck it, I'll try it that day. Whereas nowadays, if I see something that's good by one of those lower end companies that's selling knives in the lower end still, I'm not going to miss out. I'm going to get it. If the factory doesn't please me, which frankly it probably won't, I'm going to thin it out, I'm going to use it. And I think that's something that we could all sort of realize that the name, as long as it's a name steel, as long as it's not Z Hunter or Tac Force or one of those, you know, stainless steel knives or the 440 series that doesn't specify the last number. We all know, I think, what to look for now in a, in a non-steel, like in a one that's probably not even going to be heat treated. As long as it's not one of those, maybe go a mystery steel, I'd probably give a miss. All that sort of, the stuff that's just obviously sus. I'd say definitely anything from here upwards. This is like, you know, if you're looking at a scale of 1 to 10, this is sitting pretty comfortably at a 5. In terms of just being a general all-around pocket knife. 5 out of 10, that's 1 out of 2. Like, it's it's cool, like it's just an aspect of the knife, and it's just some, not something I'm happy to miss out on cool new designs for anymore. So that's one thing that's happened to me. Whether you have the apparatus to, or the, the, the skill if you're a stone sharpener to do what I've sort of been doing, then that might might 
you might not be on the same page as me, but that's kind of definitely where I've got lately. I think there's potential in even the most um, sort of low rent and low, you know, low, low prestige steels to do good work as an EDC cutting knife. So that's one thing I've learned, and it's one thing I'd sort of, um, if you take anything from all of this lately, is that if you're happy to have a play, which some of us just aren't, some of us just want to keep our knives perfect in boxes, and that is totally cool as well. Totally cool. Like, no judgment here. Like, um, I got fixed blades that I, I still haven't taken some of my fixed blades out and given them a good whacking because they're almost too nice. I get you. But really, if you're happy to have a bit of a play, I reckon you'll be able to get pretty much most steels these days in a position where they're going to work for you pretty well. Might take a bit more work. Yeah, an S110V Paramilitary 2 is going to just perform out the box. And you're going to be like, man, this edge retention is amazing. Yeah, from a box, the cheaper steels might not. But then, if you have a bit of a play, I reckon you're going to find some good times, and most importantly, you won't miss out on some really cool designs, which is definitely what's happening at the lower end of the market uh, at the moment. I hope this has been of some value to you. Um, leave a like, leave a comment, leave a subscribe, leave a bell, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye, guys.